everybody, Steven here for Krabby Bill. Um, Krabby Bill is off at the mushroom farm tonight, so I figured I'll do a video that we've been talking about for a while. So, in addition to hunting, we're also very avid gun collectors, very pro Second Amendment, pro shooting sports, pretty much anything to do with guns, we enjoy it. So, I thought I'd take some time to go over some of our more favorite pieces in our collection and you know, give you a little taste of what we do outside of the hunting realm. To start off is a gun that some people either love, hate, or just admire because it looks cool or know it from video games. And that is the 1911. Now, the 1911 is probably one of the most widely recognized pistols in the world. I would say probably besides Glock or the Beretta. And, I mean, it's earned its reputation for a reason. This gun's been in standard service with, was in the st in standard in standard service with the U.S. from World War I all the way up to Vietnam. And it's still being used today because it's so popular they can't get rid of it. I mean, and it's also been in minor conflicts around the world since then. So let me jump right into what we have. This one, I'm going to bring it in a little close. This one here, we purchased off a friend of ours. And as you can see, it's got all these markings. But this one is probably the most special out of all of them. I don't know if you could read it, but it says property of U.S. Army. So, for those of you that don't really understand, like, wouldn't really get it, this one would have been issued by the U.S. Army. This one is a Colt, actual Colt 1911, and I'll get into why that, making that specific later on, but it is a U.S. Mark, property marked Colt 1911, and I believe the manufacture date for this one was 1913. Put this back. Now, the lifespan of this gun actually dates back further than 1911. The development of this gun actually came out of a war that the U.S. fought in the, eight, the late 1800s. I'm gonna... Okay, so yeah, the development of this pistol leads all the way back to the Spanish and American War in 1898. After the U.S. beat the Spanish and, you know, gained some of its territories, we fought against the Philippines for a good 15 years. And what came out of that conflict was the realization that the U.S. needed a new standard pistol for their troops. We realized that we were vastly underprepared for the war, like the warfare of the future. That's what led to the development of pistols, of firearms such as the 1911. We realized that the double action revolvers that we were using weren't standing up to the guns being used by the Spanish who were ultimately being supplied by companies like Mauser and their self-loading rifles and pistols. So starting in about 1907, the U.S. Army had field trials to develop what was going to be their new st uh, standard service pistol such as what we just have had with the development of the new SIG pistol that's being adopted by the U.S. Army. So, the 1911 actually ended up beating out Steyr, Webley, Savage, and a few German companies whose name I'm not actually going to try to pronounce. Now, the 1911 ended up beating, in the final stages of the testing, Steyr, who was another favorite but the 1911 performed completely perfectly, and I believe it was something like 6,000 rounds were fired to determine its effectiveness. Now, after it was officially adopted March 29, 1911, which is where the, de the number designation that has stuck with it throughout the years has come from. And shortly after that adoption, the U.S. entered into the Second World War. Now, the U.S ended up purchasing, I think, 70,000 of these pistols to give to its troops. Now, Colt couldn't handle that amount of uh, order in such a short time, so it had to be brought out to other companies. So, Colt, Springfield, Remington, 
North American Arms were the main ones that um, the main ones that took the contracts. Later in the war, they brought the contracts out to other people, and I believe one of them was even Winchester. But the war ended before those contracts could be fulfilled. Between the war, we ended up with other variations of the pistol improvements, mind you, and that led to the development of the 1911 A1. And that service pistol pretty much made it through all the way to Vietnam and remained vaguely or mostly unchanged between those periods. Now, in some of the more technical aspects of the 1911, the 1911 chambered in the 45 ACP round, which is was one of the recommendations of the uh, military leaders that were conducting the field trials to find a new pistol because of experiences from the uh, wars in the Philippines. They realized that the people they were fighting against, that the 45 round did the best to actually, you know, what people refer to as stopping power. This is the magazine for the Colt. It's seven rounds. It's a single stack magazine. Now, despite being out of active service, there, in, as of 1986 with the introduction of the Beretta M9, the 1911 still finds its way in the U.S. military service. As of, as of actually, it was within probably the last ten years, the Colt, actually it was Colt again, ended up making the M45A1 Marine Pistol, which I'm going to show a picture on my phone. I don't know if it's going to come in. Which is an updated version of the pistol. You can see it's got different sights. It's got a rail section under the barrel. Sort of model it for what today's military needs. And like I said, the 1911 is still in mostly widespread service. Although not to the same extent as it was, some special operations units do still use it. I mean, because it's a good pistol, I mean, some people, part of the reason I mentioned in the beginning that people either love it or hate it, yes, the 1911 does have some reliability issues, but that, I believe that is also related to some of the lower quality models that are being offered. This pistol itself, we've only shot a few times because of its age, and we want to try to preserve it as well as it can be because you can see it's still in pretty good shape considering its age. The wood grips are starting to go a little bit, but the pistol itself was reblued, I believe, in the 1960s. But it is, in its bones, the same pistol that it was when it was first built in, like I said earlier, I believe 1913. Now, I'm not going to actually take it apart, but 1911s are a little bit temperamental when you take them apart. you got to take, and this is an unloaded pistol I showed you earlier in the video, but you got to take this button just below the barrel. You have to push down, get that out, and then it'll pull up the bushings that'll let you remove the slide. You have to lock this back and pop it out, which, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. You can see right above my thumb, or right in front of it, is a scratch which can be which is commonly known as to the idiot scratch what happens is people don't line this up correctly the slide release line it up correctly when it's being put back and have to turn it and it ends up scratching the frame now that was there when we already got it so I'm proud to say I didn't do that although I could see how people do it because I've come close with other we have more than one 1911, but I've come close before. Now another neat thing about this is, and it's a good and a bad thing really, is the 1911s, or at least this one, has a grip safety. What that means is, if you just grab the trigger, it does nothing, but if you depress that while the safety's off, the gun's able to be fired. Now. That's a, like I said, that's a good and a bad thing, because if, for whatever reason, your grip's not the best, you might have a hard time firing this gun, but you'll realize quick enough what the issue is and be able to adjust it to fire it. Now, personally, 
I like 1911s. All the ones that we have, I haven't had any problems with, but I could see why people think they're outdated and unreliable. But I personally am pretty accurate with ours. That's just my opinion. But I think the 45 is a good round. 45 ACP is a good round, and should pretty much stay in this, stay around for a while. The 1911 could probably use more modern updates. Like I said, the M45A1 is a newer model, and I'm anxious to actually get my hands on that to see if how much different it is and if it's any better than the original. Now, this is a classic piece, and I believe it should be honored as such, not only for its military service, but the ingenuity of its creator, the famed John Moses Browning, who's famous for actually is pretty much considered the father of automatic weapons fire for everything from the 1911 to the Browning automatic rifle which still bears his name well, alright that's gonna be the end of this part of the video check back in a few set few moments when I show you off something different Welcome back everyone, Steven here again. So since Krabby Bill's still at work, I'm going to uh, keep cracking on with the rest of this video. So the next gun I'm going to show you is a <clears throat> uh, something that also served with our previous weapon, the 1911. That is the Lee Enfield. The Lee Enfield is, was the British Empire's main service rifle from, from 1895 until 1957. Now it's been through many different variations and trials and errors and I mean this gun has pretty much seen every conflict from the from the, from the Boer Wars right before World War One all the way up. It's still popping up today in the Middle East and other countries that are in conflict. Now <clears throat> Let's see if we can. This model here is a number three, or a, is a number one Mark III. One of the ways you could tell, and besides the markings on the band right here behind the trigger, is that it's got this little feature right here, which is a magazine cutoff. Just use this, you know, you fire your shot, that way you don't reload and chamber another round. Personally, I don't understand what that's for, but it's there and it was removed after the number three or no sorry the number one mark three with the asterisk next to it I forget what that actual designation is but that's what it was <clears throat> now the Lee Enfield came in I believe I said 1896 check that again double check my facts 1895 with, and came as a replacement for the Martini Henry and also for the Lee Metford which was another rifle in common use at the time by the British Army and its various colonial forces now <clears throat> one of the good things about this rifle and it was really it's really a very accurate rifle a very usable rifle I mean somebody with this could still pretty much hold their own if they needed to despite the fact that it is a bolt action rifle it's chambered in the 303 British round and it's a 10 round magazine and you could actually pop it out and if for whatever reason you have multiple ones of these and don't have the time to work the bolt and work with the stripper clips if you have a couple of these already loaded you could just go then you're ready to go another neat thing about these things is, is that you can uh, the bolt I don't know if you can actually see that I'm just realizing the camera angle is kind of weird okay, let's move that back over here what I was saying is the the bolt you can work it pretty fast that was one of the cool things about this 
and why this rifle kind of dominated in the First World War, because it could be fired rounds so quickly, soldiers were able to do what was called a mad minute, and that's this rifle is where that phrase came from, actually, because you could fire this rifle so fast, I mean, rounds were just coming out like a storm of lead. <clears throat> And the neat thing about this rifle is, because of how the wide-reaching arm of the British Empire and its various colonial holdings, it's been used from everybody from the British. I mean, there's... What, uh, I, I gotta look it up and I'll just read off some of the, the wars this rifle's been in. I mean, it's I've mentioned the Boer War, First World War, the Irish War of Independence, Spanish Civil War, World War Two, the Greek Civil War, the Korean War, the the Irish Republican Army border campaigns, the Congo Crisis. It was used in Vietnam by British and Commonwealth forces. I mean, it was used. It's still used today because it's been people have found it in Afghanistan and Iraq, and even in Syria and some of the other countries that are still at war in the Middle East. Now. This model specifically is the short magazine Lee Enfield. As I, I'm going to pop back out and show you. This is the short magazine. Now, the, the MLE version, which is the magazine Lee Enfield, was produced from 1895 to 1904. This model, the SMLE, was produced from 1904 and it's still being produced today, although in smaller, more niche numbers. There was, I mean, there were so many different variants that over 17 million of these rifles and its variants have been developed in the years. I mean, there was also specialty variants, sniper versions. There was the number five jungle carbine that was a lot smaller for used in the jungle climates, Vietnam, the Second World War, stuff like that. You know. <clears throat> This rifle was officially taken out of service in 1957 when the British Empire adopted the L1A1 SLR, also known as the FAL, which is, I mean, anybody who knows me personally knows I love that rifle, I love the history behind it, the cartridge is amazing, and it may not have been developed by the British, but it is one of the pinnacles of their small arms that, uh, I mean, it was, it's still one of my favorite rifles that have ever been produced. This rifle, however, is also one of them. This rifle, I mean, is a beast. It's actually surprisingly light considering its size and it's the heft of the bullet behind it. The 303 British round is no small round, and I would show one, but it would take me too long to get the round out of where we keep our ammunition, and it would throw off my flow. So I'm going to actually show you one thing, because I know the video can act, the camera can actually see it. The neat thing is, it's got a safety right here, that little notch, no fire. Pull that back up, click. Now you saw me work the bolt, you know that this rifle was unloaded and I know what's above me, so that's why I felt comfortable doing that. But mostly what I pulled it up here to show you this is, if you turn this, or if you lift the bolt, pull it back, why is it? there we go, so you take the bolt out. It's a lot easier than most other rifles, I mean, I have modern rifles that are bolt action that are less, a lot less easy to take the bolt out of than this. Put it back in, you just make the notch, there we go, and you're back in. Now this bolt isn't as smooth and buttery as some of the videos and the combat footage of this rifle I've seen, mostly because it's an older rifle. This rifle was, let me double check on it, I believe this one's 1918. The, the markings on it are a little bit smudged because of, I guess, use has caused the, the markings to fade over the years. You can still see, as I showed you earlier, right here, 
it says SMLE number three, or Mark three, and it's still got the Royal Crown and it's got the years on there. The problem is you can see it says 19 something, and it really looks like it says 1918. The eight's a little bit hard to read because of the print from the stamps on them, but you can see that this specific Enfield was a, see it's got the disc on it, the proof disc. The British were very, I mean most European gun companies at that time were very, I don't almost want to say anal about their markings, they wanted you to know that this rifle was theirs. They wanted you to know they checked it, it's good, buy it, use it. The British, this British Enfield, I mean, it's, the British Enfield is probably one of the better weapons that was used during the First World War. Second World War started to get outclassed with the invention of the self-loading rifles, the Garand, the SVT-40, even the Gewehr 43, the was a little bit better, but this rifle is accurate, quick, it had a good round behind it, and the British were very heavy on their rifle training, so they were able to get this rifle fielded correctly. And that's why it's still one of our favorite rifles. Alright, I'm going to be putting this away now, so join me again in a little bit, and I will show you something else pretty neat.